Once upon a time, the conversation between brand and consumer used to be one way. They could talk at us, but not to us. But now with the rise of digital apps such as ChatGPT, social media, algorithms, WhatsApp, now it's a constant conversation that goes both ways. But is this good for us? Are we living in an age of digital distress, which means that we need a digital de-stress? Welcome to the Mental Space Podcast. Now, my guest today is a retail expert, a voice for good in the retail world, but has also seen the rise of social media in our lives and how the retail industry has used it more and more and more for the conversation. Of course, my guest is Kate Hardcastle, MBE nonetheless, aka the customer whisperer. That's true. Welcome to the Mental Space Podcast. Thank you, Scott. So we always have a tradition on the podcast, Kate, which is to ask, what does mental health mean to you? I think uh, being truthful, which is what I think your podcast is about, um, mental health is becoming increasingly more important to me. Mm. Um, I don't think I've been kind to my mental health. In right. fact, I think I've been um, very contradictory. I've been a trustee of charities talking about this and young people. I have tried to do so much work with giving back to SMEs yeah. and tried to help them look after their mental health when I've simply not looked after my own. I think it is the motor in your bill in your in your being that mm. keeps you going. Yeah. And I think many of today's progressive cars, just like as our incredible bodies, can keep going even with warning lights on. I think my warning lights been on and I've ignored it quite a lot because it's felt too problematic to deal with. But I am becoming increasingly aware as I get older and as I've become a parent yeah. that it's something I have to be much better at. Where's that education come from then? Like we always ask the next question, I go, it's like, how is your mental health today? But kind of in general, when, when did you wake up to this then? Um, I think there were probably two points. I yeah. think for me, there was a big moment of being a parent. I yeah. think it was something that I always wanted to do. It wasn't the easiest to do. And I think through that process, I became so fixated on actually the end result that I didn't then think about the journey of being a parent for life, yeah, right? Yeah, we yeah, are a absolutely. parent for life. Yeah. And I was talking to my children as soon as they were able to understand about things that I hoped would be good life lessons, realizing that I wasn't actually taking my own medicine. Now in business, that's easy to do. We easy, can do that yeah. a lot. Yeah. But I think when you've got to be completely and 100% authentic with your family, yeah. you have to learn. And I think also then age, aging is a huge part of it. We are on a race to the top in the business environment and world a lot, and it has become a point where you've been taught. I've been absolutely educated, even by mentors, to push aside feelings, to look at the mechanics. Yeah. Um, so I've had to reintroduce that actually it's okay to do that and, and celebrate a little bit more about myself rather than being incredibly unkind. How has that been then? How's that transition been from you know, super busy, career focused, reach for the top. How's that transition from that mindset to look after yourself, look after the family, fit my own oxygen mask first? Um, so how's that journey been and what's it taught you? Um, it's been a very challenging one. When I'm listening to uh, conversations like this, I get quite frustrated because I know some of the individuals and then I'm hearing the words they're saying and it's still not actually their authentic truth. I, yeah. I don't know whether they feel or see that really. Um, I think we can convince ourselves quite regularly that we're doing things and we're not. We might be you know, attending that um, yoga session. We might be taking that retreat, but really are we switched off are we doing what we need to do yeah um, many of my friends have mental health conditions that they talk to me about very regularly and i've been utterly silent scott i've been almost like oh, i can't even begin to talk about how i feel that would be um, an opening of something I, I wouldn't even know how to deal with the onslaught of it but i think i've had to go slowly and surely and methodically um and i think for me um it's the kindest thing we can do to the next generation Absolutely. I mean, I worry about our next generation. I mean, one of the reasons behind mental was my children. Um, and I think this kind of like segues nicely into what we're going to talk about today, because I know you were super passionate about it. But when you and I grew up, um, we were in a much less complicated world. Mm. You know, the conversation was only that one way that we talked about at the top. Mm. Now our children are growing up in this sewer of communication. It never stops. Mm. Um, 
talk to me about digital distress then that you're seeing because you were saying before like you often work with brands and you try to get brands to be authentic is that not happening anymore look i think you know let's get under the hood of it because yeah. it's a little bit of a complex issue right i think organizations hear see almost cut copy paste from one another mm -hmm. from whatever the zeitgeist is yeah and I think as much as organizations intend to be purposeful, I don't think many people get up to work in the morning and feel they put their villain outfit on and think, yes, that's it. I'm going to ruin people's lives and make it an incredibly bad there place to some, live. I think. Of course, I said not all because you and I have probably <laughs> met them, but I do think really we do want things to, to get better, be but okay. we get lost in the moment. We yeah. get lost in, in, in what's happening. Yeah. And a lot of it is because the skills and the abilities and the technology that is available to us, as you just said, yeah. was better ever. So let's go back to that storytelling piece, Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time, my news incoming was only on a TV channel, of which there were three terrestrial channels. Absolutely. And it was an appointment to view, and we would get our news. There would always be an and finally, and the and finally, so we say in the UK news, and finally, there would always be a good story, whatever that was. And it was done intentionally to yeah. bring some joy, to help you go to sleep at night. As we know, you've been in media many years. I deeply apologize for that. A news story that is more challenging to read is more impactful. Yeah. And this onslaught is where there is a huge amount of opportunity for organizations. And I think sometimes it's very difficult to believe that as well as organizations that might be challenged and called out, individuals are regularly challenged and called out. And therefore that becomes the cycle and the psyche. So we have young children, as young as two or three, recognizing hundreds of brands, interacting and engaging cross-platform, cross-opportunity, and there's no off button. Yeah. You know, we had a giant switch on the television and it went off and yeah. my parents decided that. Yeah. And it went back on at set times of day for set programming that had almost been vetted for us. Messaging on advertisements and billboards was limited. It was a different world. Other problems then, yeah, but a different world. And we have this onslaught now and it's almost impossible to switch it off. And we have more businesses leaning into technology to use the opportunity to hyper-personalize messages, to email bombard you almost, to yeah. find you every place, every time, everywhere. And my work, which is beyond retail, I've always uh, been known as a retail specialist because the TV work I do, but yeah. I've worked literally cradle to grave. So nursery products through to funerals and celebrations of life because my expertise is the consumer. The consumer is as a consumer does, and I understand the patterns and behaviors, but it doesn't matter the sector, Scott. The consumer is telling me they are feeling overwhelmed, overloaded. So let me give you an example yeah. of a theme park. Yeah. A theme park where you think you're booking to reconnect with your family, thinking that you're going to go and have what we call real life physical experience. That's you know? the dream they sell us. Right, you know, get on the carousel I, I, horse. I suddenly am going to be 12 years old like the kids I am on the ride right. with. Exactly, yeah. eat the ice cream, yeah. laugh together, smile together, listen to the shows. And of course some of that happened. But even when the mapping systems push you to an app, the wait time in a queue is released yeah. by giving a child another app to play with to kill the time. I mean. It's constant. I've literally just come back from Japan and spent a long time at theme parks queuing. And yeah, you absolutely get it. It's everywhere, isn't it? It's everywhere every time. And you spend a lot of your time there just staring at the app, rather, you know, looking for the direction rather than looking around and trying to explore the world that was that. Exactly. Uh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. So look, when we look at social media in general, shall we say, um, I, I always worry that it's difficult enough for us. And we've had time to develop, in theory, some emotional intelligence. Our kids don't have that time. And like, we're stressed out from it. You're saying consumers are saying they're stressed out by it. What do you fear? What do you think? What do you see is the impact on our children then? I think uh, we've just been given a talk this morning in the UAE on yeah. exactly this segmentation and the different generations and how this impacts. Um, we have big differences in small demographic segmentation. So what that means simplified is 
quite often in business, we'll put people in pigeonholes. It doesn't really work very much because personalities are coming at large. Thankfully, we're allowed to be the thumbprint we are, individual, unique. But there are traits that tend to fit, particularly among stage range. Yeah. And um, we have, in such a short space of time, a technology overload. So we've got millennials, then uh, Gen Zs, then Gen As. So if you look at a Gen A, um, the youngest generation, they are um, school, primary school age. They are, they've never known anything other than yeah. technology. Yeah. Uh, analog world is very different to them. They can't go to a sink and turn on taps. You know, they, they, everything's got to be automated. However, we're even seeing that sort of that DNA memory that the kids have actually got the ability to use devices. Our bodies are changing. Yeah, absolutely. Our physical bodies are changing yeah. to deal process with even in primary school my daughter's <clears throat> in primary school they're already using at the age of eight a lot of their homework mm. is all done not by handwriting not in analog but on apps right. and on ipads yeah so this is it you know the the, the, the school and, and i've just done a huge conference for schools this week and i've heard from a lot of the head teachers at that conference yeah. the challenges they're facing yeah and that's where we come into a much darker side of digital distress um but the reality is Technology is easy, convenient. It, it should be something that helps us take out the trash in every part of business and life. Yeah. But my hope, my aim, and my absolute purpose is that that time is then reframed for more human-to-human -human connection, mm -hmm. not to be reused in other forms of digital. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So why and how can we get to a point and how can we make it matter for those young people to actually know that that's a different journey that's something that can be done and can be afforded to them to go back to the different uh, sort of demographics you know gen a i think at least have got parent awareness yes. in terms of we see yes. this we know this yeah. and we can understand this whereas actually the older age groups the parents absolutely didn't have a clue a lot of the time what was going on yeah. and the younger people were the converts they were the engineers they were the ones that rode the wave first so at least i think by now we're starting to catch up mm. with the reality of it i think a lot of concern can be with particularly the gen z's who've just had to navigate that world for themselves absolutely they've kind of been left by themselves i was literally in this conversation just the other day as well with, right. with, with gen x and boomers right and they go oh look at this and it's like Look, it's hard enough for us to put the mobile phone down. Yeah. We doom scroll yeah. at our age, even though we're not digital natives. They've grown up in this sewer of shite detritus that's been fed to them. They've been given no tools and whatsoever. Mm. They've been given no filter mm. whatsoever. So they're actually, and we look at the mental health figures around the world, Gen Z struggling more than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's a massive surprise because they've had unfiltered access to this you know, always on with no mental health, with, with, with no emotional intelligence in terms of age, wisdom, experience, at the same time, no curriculum at schools teaching them about strange danger, mm. teaching them about time to switch off, teaching you about that. So what do you think is super important then for Gen A and, and the kids that come after Gen A? What must we be doing now? And what are you saying to the people that you work with, the industries you work with? Because the almighty buck, the PL, demands that the advertising industry is going to keep selling us the dream 24 7, 25 8, as the kids probably never say. But what are you saying? How do we fix this? Look, there has to be an agreement to alliances. This is not just a business issue. Mm -hmm. It's a government issue, legislation, yeah. etc. But let me just give a little bit of um, hindsight in terms of what we went through when we were trying to work with the social media companies um, as part of a charity formation of uh, a round table. So I was a trustee of the Diana Award. Yeah. It was Princess Diana's only legacy. Um, the Princess William and Harry were a big, not a big part of it, a significant part of it. Yeah, yeah. It deals with anti-bullying in, uh, in the classrooms, but then obviously particularly online. And we were a voice of many around this opportunity to create legislation for social media and understanding where we could put barriers, safety nets, et cetera. Yeah. And when I look at that legislation that was finally stamped and agreed and is starting to come into place, some of it's out of date already. Yeah. Right? That's the reality of it. The tech's moving so quickly. 
how can we put things in place that are going to safeguard when actually some of them might already th fall through the cracks yeah. by the time we get to a point that it goes through a rigorous process, understandable. So then it falls back onto other community leaders, other social leaders and peer-to-peer. -peer. So peer-to-peer -peer awareness, I think, is really important. Are we giving people the toolkit and the signposts to understand? As a parent, if I hadn't have been involved with those charities, which was mere coincidental, yeah. I would be absolutely out of my depth. And most days still feel that I am struggling. Like any parent. Like any parent yeah. on many issues, but particularly with navigating technology. Yeah. Um, you sometimes can overcompensate. So we have a saying in our house, like touch the grass. And it doesn't mean literally touch the grass. It means we're gonna do something now to go off grid. And we just did Route 66 as a family, which I'm still actually processing myself. Five days on the road is quite a challenge, no devices. <laughs> um, but it, it, so, it isn't um, just those instant hits. It isn't just about this is a plaster over a crack. This is yeah, yeah. big, hearty, meaty issues. Business is really interesting. Um, I'll be running the Future Gazer stage at Cannes Lions again this year, which gives me an amazing opportunity to talk to some of the biggest brands, the biggest businesses, and understand where they're seeing the state of play over the next few years. Yeah. And sometimes we have to talk in months because that's the reality as well. The timescales are short and the changes are big. Yeah. And I think that there is a responsibility, and if we talk about mental health, on the business leaders themselves. I see this as... We're dealing with a seabed of issues that were not our making, right? Okay. Diversity, yeah. stakeholder support, uh, sustainability. Yeah. We didn't make a lot of this mess. It's ours to deal with. Whilst trying to ensure that we're more human as business, whilst trying to make sure that we still make profit in a very challenging economic environment, yeah. whilst making sure that in a fast-paced world where there's no stickability of a consumer, you can create that. That's a lot on a business leader's shoulders. Yeah. So I think we've got to also be realistic. And a lot of it comes down to hearing, true listening, yeah. really absorbing what your stakeholders, your customers, and the brand needs to be the tone of voice, and then communicating really well. So not greenwashing, rainbow wash, whatever it might be, literally being authentic with a customer. Imagine a brand that came out and said, we're not going to promise you the earth because we can't deliver the earth. But we're going to work with you on this. We'd like to create a new app that will help you save time in these ways. But it's going to be sending you to technology again. Where would you like some of the human-human to contact to come in as a balance-off to that? And I think that's, for me, key. Um, working with um, the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority, and talking about the pressure of money, cash, yeah. disappearing out of the economy and the pressure on older people yeah. and really understanding that pressure and then realizing that in the event of fraud growing, particularly with that age group in most territories across the world, um, helplines that people were sent to of an older age group, particularly who aren't as comfortable digital, would straight be back into digital. Yeah. I mean, imagine that. Imagine the mental health on that. You've had your world save, your life savings taken and then you have to deal with a melee of trying to get through another digital world to try and get it resolved. Probably starting with the chatbot. Um, well, interesting aside, and I'll just ask you, do you think, because obviously we celebrate or financial companies often celebrate, you know, and we live here in the UE as well, um, that contactless payment, because uh, it's so convenient. And it's fascinating, again, having just been to Japan, which you think would be one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. And contactless payment is a massive thing, but they still treasure cash and the, and the contact that comes with cash. Do you think we're losing something just as a society, even those fractional conversations we have because of the lack of physical exchange now? 100%. I yeah. think in Japan, you mentioned that, and I think I would add to that service. There's yeah. still human to human touch Absolutely. point. Absolutely. And it's incredible. And making that know. moment happen. Yeah. And that can do so much for a brand. And I yeah. think it's my job and other people like me to convince yeah. the stakeholders and the business leaders that these are opportunities, they're worth the investment, and that shortcuts probably will limit the potential, particularly when you think about the brand as an asset on your bottom line, yeah. right? So it's. It's got to be convinced, I think, that 
look, there is an opportunity in this rather than you just should do it because it's the right thing to do as well yeah. as dealing with all these other issues. And we've got to make it look sexy and good yeah. to enhance the opportunity for brands to do it. Let's talk about the business case. And I often do this, you know, talk about the business case um, and the ROI of mental health and leading into people's mental health because it is good business to be a good business. Yeah. You will actually make more money if you look after your team. Yeah. If, if I think about, again, the, the magic of the transaction between me and the family-run sushi restaurant with 12 people in it and the quality of that interaction one of the most memorable even though he didn't speak english and i didn't speak japanese but i'm trying on on tech technology assisted that in terms of google yes. translate yes. and then i try and talk to him he tries to me but that there was charm and there was magic and authenticity in that transaction between two how do you scale that up in a way or how do you convince businesses that that's because i'll remember that transaction forever yes um 99.99999% of transactions are meaningless to me mm. other than simply a facilitator payment in the biggest possible. Mm. How do you persuade the industry about the magic of that and the value of that and the power of that? And how is that good for sales? You know, it's increasingly difficult to do so as well, Scott, because when I started out in business, data was quite expensive and it was a, a very limited resource you know yeah. we would have reports that were created that cost a lot of money yeah. you'd almost kind of like nick your competitors like leftovers with it right and now we've got data overload yeah. as well which i think can read any measure any time and the problem is for every person out there trying to form good and create a proof point on your scenario just described yeah there'll be another piece that says actually use technology. It'll simplify it. You can take this overhead out and this yeah. is the numbers behind it. Yeah. So what we've got to do is get into the emotional intelligence, a phrase I love as well, of the leaders. We've got to make it real to them and relevant to them. They have to live the experience. Yeah. We used to call it walk the floors. You yeah. have to physically breathe, live, see it yourself. And that's what I'm doing with the leaders that I'm working with. I take them on the journey. I show them the touch points. I actually let them realize what that, feels like and that's the thing everything in black and white is not a feeling and yet when we actually feel it we feel differently and if you look at you know I'm not going to cite any particular brand as excellent or not but you will have heard of the famous British retailer Marks and Spencers indeed it, it has had the most woeful of times challenges it lost its way incredibly the food kind of survived its food and clothing did not I know it has a different reputation globally yeah. but it was 10 years of the worst headlines any brand could imagine yeah. its turnaround has been slow and hard and laborious but when I think about the leader there he walks the floors okay. he used to be a supermarket trolley collector he understands yeah. and he is a human to human person. And I think that is how we will win the war. Not perhaps the race, but I think that's how we get the big job done. And we've got to do it. We are batting carriers on mental health yeah. for the next generation. We won't see the beauty, I don't think, of what this can all look like. But I think unless we do our part, it's never going to get there. Do you think we're entering to a period of time now as well where perhaps that's never been more important with the advent of AI and I'm a kind of big believer in two things can be true at the same time in that AI is the future of humanity but humanity is the future of humanity and in fact that humanity is now the only path forward for us as this technology just increases at a pace that I certainly you know can't comprehend what's happening I think so I think we will always feel we go back to our dna we go back to our the anthropology of it if you like in yeah. terms of how we have uh, always found out other tribes yeah. you know shopping was a tribal thing yeah. you might not actually fancy chatting to people and being around people but it allowed you to be in the presence of people and we find that strangely comforting yeah. you know we still work with those same kind of core reactions instincts etc i believe in that and i've yeah. spoken to many brilliant psychologists on that and I lean into those tools to make things work. The heartbeat, it, it beats 40 million times a year. It's a spectacular muscle, but then it's still sensitive enough to flutter. Mm. You might, make to want, to, you might make, want to make it flutter to fall in love. I want to make it flutter to maybe have a service that's brilliant or a, a, a sale that's brilliant and passionate. And I don't get that out of Android-led, like you said, black and white, not memorable transactions. Yeah. I know 
and we have stats, but we need more than stats, that if I make you feel great about mm. a purchase and that about 80, 90% of purchases are still emotionally led anyway, yeah. that we will do better and do more. Now ask me, is that the easiest route? Not at all. It's harder, it takes longer, you need almost a cultural consistency that's very difficult to achieve, and you need the ability of every single upside down part of that business yeah. to believe and buy into it. What is it, when you take those CEOs, you know, back to the shop floor, what's the transformation you see? Um, I think it's quite interesting. It isn't instant resistance, it's instant, oh gosh, yes, must do something about that. Mm. Um, then it's the reality. Okay, what what does doing something about that look like? Yeah. Um, and I think it's then the reality of what is the sort of sweet spot, I guess, of what can be done, mm -hmm. and where where will technology still be a big part of the the equation? I I feel we need to make technology more human and and human sometimes human to human connection a little bit more advanced and a little bit more consistent. And I think that's what we love about tech. So I think. We've got to be sophisticated in our thinking here. We've got to be real. I don't think as buyers, both consumers and B2B customers, we get enough in terms of an explanation of what the journey of a transaction is going to look like. Okay. I don't think we're given any rule book or parameters. And I think a lot of it's left to chance. Unless you've got a meaty contract, who goes through those really anyway, other than the solicitors and lawyers? Nobody. Yeah. I don't think we do enough storytelling at the outset. This is who we are. This is what we're going to deliver you. This is what good looks like. This is what excellent looks like. This is how it's going to feel. And I think we should be doing that day in, day out as brands so that everyone can feel and understand, okay, I'm buying into this. I know the parameters. That means, you know, we're not going to have pressure on the shop floor because we're not expecting perfection or we're not going to have pressure on the call center because people understand the calls will be to the point. Whatever it might be, let's set the story up to start with so we stop causing pain for people on the other side. Still man this one for me. Um, in When you look at this and the direction of travel, what does the future look like if we get this right? And what does the future look like if we don't do anything or even lead into it and get it wrong. Because we saw the unintended consequences of technology when we brought in social media. Again, as you said, I don't believe when, even when Mark Zuckerberg you know, sat down with, to, to create Facebook, it wasn't, I'm going to ruin the world. It was, oh, this is a good piece of technology. But there was no consideration on the path. And now we are where we are mm -hmm. with the impact that social media can have in our lives. So... Risk versus reward. What's the great future? And what do you see as a re as, what's the thing that worries you mostly for your, for your children? Well, for my children. You see, that's the difference. You flick the switch to parent, don't you? And I think that becomes a very hit, hard-hitting concept to think of. Look, I think people perhaps uh, surface skim too much when it comes to the reality of tech that's available to our children and yeah. how many places they can get to. Um, think about things like Discord and, and so many other areas that perhaps even a parent doesn't see. Yeah. We, we need legislation. We need it quickly. Okay. We need to have um, an education piece, as I said, put in. We need business owners to face into how do they use it, where they're going to use it, and where they're going to try and have that human-human connection and, and, and be really bold to be upfront about that. Um, I don't think any major high street bank of which many branches have now been removed for someone like the United Kingdom happening in America too, yeah. ever turned around to its customers and said, this is what the future looks like. Are you happy with it? Yeah, because yeah. I think they would have had a very different reaction and they could have worked harmoniously with it. So what does it look like if we get this right? I don't think we'll get it right, but we'll get it better. I think it means that we will take hold of a slightly out of control vehicle and we will get it back on pat track and on path might not always be the path we're expecting, might be detours, shortcuts, different terrain, but at least we'll feel in the driving seat. Mm. If we don't, we're not in the driving seat. So how does that feel? As a parent, as you asked me, incredibly scary. Yeah. I can't give my children many things in life. I can't give them guarantees. They ask me for them all of the time. I would love to be able to reassure them and I can't lie to them. So I have to be real. I can't make them feel that I can make everything better. I want to, 
But what I can do is I can calmly explain using statistics, using everything I know as my barometer, yeah. what I think it can look like. And that's reassuring to them. So I kind of feel maybe we apply that in a business sense. How can we reassure? How can we almost, not physically obviously, but hold the hand of people through this tumultuous time yeah. and help them? Because I believe when it comes to mental health, and you're the expert and you speak to the experts, but I believe it's almost this scenario where it's an all pile on and you'll never know the bit that just yeah. provokes and takes you there. Yeah. And that might quite likely be your internet going down or not being able to reach your bank or having a bad transaction in store. And there's no rhyme or reason, Scott, but it hurts and it breaks. And I think we've got to be realizing that we are so, again, a magical machine in our brain, so susceptible to messages consciously and subconsciously to, to how we feel. You know, we, we don't always have that, yes, I know exactly how I feel at this moment in time, and I'm really good with that. If we go back to the way that brands communicate to customers these days, and again, when we say when it used to be, used to be radio and TV, okay, um, and back then... I wonder what your opinion is on this one, because back then, even advertising campaigns and science was created by human beings, mm -hmm. targeted to human beings. Um, and you can argue that human beings sold lies to other human beings. True. Okay. Now we have, have we crossed almost like the Rubicon because we've now got algorithms who, which have been a, created by the smartest people on the planet. And we now have AI that's learning even more at an exponential rate that we can't keep up at. I mean, sometimes that feels like, you know, particularly for parents, like think about who you're up against. You know, you, you're not up against Facebook. You're up against incredible algorithms that learn at a rate that we can't. So the deck is stacked against us. And how do we, how do we put that back in the box? Because I'm not sure we can put it you back can't, in the box. You cannot put it back in the box. It's yeah. here. It's ever present. And there's a good chance if we're going from a parent point of view. But I think actually even for up here, our network, yeah. you know, our network to network, I don't think you probably realize just how much it's interacting, engaging and make a difference on that person's life. And that's scary. Yeah. It is out of control. Yeah. And I think we've got to therefore use our sophistication, our intelligence, our brilliance, and I go back to that caveman our element, our humanity, yeah. to make change. Should it be, if you think about a hierarchy of needs, should it be near the top? Absolutely. Yeah. And should it be purposeful, intentional? Should it be the alliances? You know, I want to see big business leaders coming around the table to talk about this. I want to see not a contest of who's got the biggest car, who's got the biggest social media. I actually want to see cohesive behavior and decisiveness yeah. that will make change because it's the right thing to do. I'm going to come, I'll circle back around to that in a moment. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something you, you mentioned earlier when you talked about legislation. You say we need legislation. What to you does that look like? Because I, again, I'm thinking about, you know, if we thought about the message to consumers, we used to advertise, you know, uh, cigarettes everywhere. Now cigarettes come with horrific pictures that illustrate the damage that they do to us. Mm. Do we need a digital version of that? I think when we look at carrot and stick approach on anything from plastic bags yeah. on sustainability through to yeah. cigarette health, uh, warnings that are coming through on food, you know, I think you've got to ensure that it's a problem worth dealing with that approach. And are we at that point with digital Highly likely, yeah. yeah. We do need Digital help. Digital de-stress. Absolutely. Yeah. We do need support. My fear is the speed of which I'm seeing it. I'm asked two main questions. One's about AI pretty much all the time and one's yeah. about legislation of all of this. Okay. The reality of the speed of which legislation come, come into play and the rate and speed of which this is growing and going and the fact that the openness of the playing field is so level that you probably don't even realize all the entrants in the market, everyone who's playing the game, everyone who's a big part of it. They might be nameless, they might be faceless. I mean, this isn't an easy navigation. We don't go around to, you know, Mr. X's house and say, right, okay, get the, yourself the Bond here. The villain's island. Yeah, here's, here's your rules. <laughs> Make sure you stick to them. Thanks yeah. very much. 
um, and no amount of fines, no amount, you know, we've got to be realistic about the scenario. Yeah. So is it a case of, is instead of looking at fair comply a more of a tipping point piece where through some co-act of legislation, governance, education, businesses stepping up, even, as I say, we as consumers stepping up, do the right thing. I, I just, I don't think the human in me is ever going to allow anyone to be in harm mm. and not do something about I think instinctively I move to support that. And it's very difficult then just because it's digital that we wouldn't do the same. Scott, let's be real here. We have perfectly healthy young people in every other sense, yeah. incredibly sadly taking their own lives at yeah. increasing amounts because of the pressure of a world they didn't ask for that was our generation's creating. What worries me on that one more than anything else is when we look at those statistics around particularly our young people around the world, whether it be the UK, uh, Australia, completely. every single country, yeah. you know, and the suicide statistics and the mental health damage that our ge that generation is struggling with, there's no, where's the government inquiry? Where, where's the task force to deal with it? We, Gen X and boomers, particularly in leadership positions, will look at that generation and roll their eyes and just go, oh, they're weak. They haven't got resilience. Um, we were miserable. They should be miserable too. Where, where, how do we have this conversation where we go, actually, yeah, we have really dealt our younger generation pretty shit hand of cards here you know maybe i might be fortunate but yeah. i've got to say every organization i've gone in where we're having these conversations mm. and it's not for me to resolve this issue with ceos yeah. it's for me to ensure that their customers are delighted that we bring joy in their lives yeah. but it becomes part of the conversation pretty quickly that's not been their reaction they want to make change they understand it isn't going to be um the most uh, profit efficient yeah. they understand that there is work again here to do but I think there is desire for change. It's whether, is there enough change quickly enough? Yeah. And that's the challenge, the speed of this. That's, I cannot emphasize enough, the speed of change. I did a huge study where I went back 20 years in consumerism yeah. and then compared it to the last 20 years. I mean, it was like literally maybe in a shop, but a slightly more digitized till. There were modicums of change. Yeah. And then change Overnight. you couldn't even wish yeah. or think or sleep of. And, and I am part of this. I am a leader evolving technology to fit into business, to make things better, faster, quicker. And I have to stand up and play my part. And I think I'm doing that. And yeah. I truly think you know, being a Malcolm Gladwell advocate, but I do think we are going to get to a tipping point. It's how we then put that good intention together. Yeah. I don't think there's enough. So a lot of events I've been hosting and speaking at over the year so far bring together the best business heads. There's been panels on AI. There's been conversations about digital and there's been conversations about mental health. There's not been a conversation to say, right, okay, let, whilst you guys are here, let's connect let's, all let's the dots. get you uh, in the room. Yeah. So, and so let's be the instigators of that. So you've been having some of those conversations. Also, you've been having some of those conversations here in the region. Mm. What have you, your takeaways been from that? Um, look, I think it's kind of a, a bit of a, a paleness and a wide-eyed realisation mm. at the moment. I don't think when the, the coins all drop that people are probably realising that it's not an anomaly of the moment or a, a point of uniqueness of a generation. It's yeah. here to stay and it's yeah, yeah. doing such challenge and harm. And I think when you yeah. do connect the dots, it's kind of that realization of, oh, right, okay, yeah, and what am I going to do? Um, we kind of almost need like a David Attenborough type voice. You know, you see, David Attenborough makes so much more impact with bringing those pictures to life when it comes to sustainability message than any messaging on the side of a can of yeah. a soft drink. Yeah. And ditto, we really kind of need more programming, more information, more educate. We have to educate ourselves and others on this. So I like to think if you have a website or a social media presence and you're a business, what can you do to kind of advocate for, understand, offer up, some support where, where are you in where are you kind of putting your hat in the ring and saying yeah absolutely count me on this journey brilliant um you talked about carrot and stick yeah and talking about brands and customer reactions um is there a case to be made for look if you are not a good brand 
and you don't embrace good business practices that you are going to be punished by consumers. Ultimately, when that story of how you behave in the world comes out, and I'm thinking, you know, customers of the post office recently back in the UK, and the fact that that story was finally told in a compelling way. We've kind of known about that story for decades, but now it's finally been told in a compelling way. You know, the post office as a brand has been absolutely decimated. Um, we've seen other brands previously, but in this digital age where they think it's a gold rush towards maximizing profits, do they also run the risk of those same digital tools exposing them and destroying their business? So there's a real, is, is there a real time for them to wake up and go, do you know, actually you can't behave um, just as you want because ultimately the consumer will find out and then the consumer will punish you. You know, this for me could be an hour long conversation because I think it's the heart of the issue yeah. and I'm not going to be anything other than honest. We have pick and mix ethics as consumers. Yeah. And I am a consumer, I can yeah, say yeah, that, yeah. where, you know, this almost hierarchy of needs becomes a hierarchy of needs. And at the top of it, we might say, oh, my good, we just watched that Attenborough documentary. I must save the whales. Yeah. Fill in with animal of your choice. Yeah. And then the next day, you get a pop up for a fast fashion brand and it's just what you want at a price you want to pay and it's there tomorrow. Yeah. The hierarchy, hierarchy changes. So... Consumers have got to start being honest with themselves, not just beating up the brands. Brands have got to be honest with themselves, saying, look, this is going to take longer. This is going to cost more. This is going to be this impact. But we're yeah. doing it for these reasons. That's education coming into it. And I think long term, absolutely, brand value will be benefited for doing the right thing right here, right now. Yeah. But as you just mentioned, I tuned into the post office scandal a long time ago. I wrote about the post office scandal I think of my articles, probably one of the lowest performing. And there was an incredible journalist who's been at the BBC, yeah. Nick. I think it's Nick Ward. Apologies if I get the name wrong. He was championing this in the courtrooms from literally Decades. the very beginning. Yeah. And even before that, the computer technology magazines who were then doing the same. Yeah. And they, I don't know, must be part delighted and also part, oh my goodness, we were whistleblowers here on something that, thanks to an ITV documentary, has finally resonated. And why did it resonate? Because of storytelling. Yeah. And that is how I want to answer the question. We have to get better at telling the story to compel people to make the change. I would a million percent agree with that. Um, yeah, storytelling is one of the things we... And again, we talk about the behavioral science around storytelling. I think we need to make, tell a better story to businesses around the benefits of mental health. As you say, if, okay, so if, we, if we have a message to the C-suite um, and the CEOs who are supposed to be the stewards of the long-term sustainability of companies, what do you think the opportunity is for the company that says today, particularly as we've got Gen Alpha and future generations coming down, who are going to be better educated about all of this than we were and the, the millennials were and, our, and the Gen Z that's growing up right now? What do you think the benefit, the, the reward, the carrot on the table is for those that make what will be actually quite a tricky decision in the short term to actually be a good business in the long term? I'm going to answer that question with a little caveat to some incredible leaders I know and work with of larger organizations. But when you become the leader of a large organization, of which I have been, the pressure on you is multifold and it's not about always the long-term game. It's about shareholders, stakeholders. It's about um, p &L. It's about the workforce that need to pay the rent and the mortgages. It's mm. about doing the right thing in multiple time zones, right? And, and, and It's it, not easy. It's certainly not easy. So even if your heart is telling you to do something, you have the reality of doing your job, progressing your career on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. So yes, there are brilliant people, but there are people that will perhaps disregard some of those uh, thoughts yeah. in the moment of making decisions. Yeah. And there are many organizations, Scott, that have been almost created by people with this passion for entrepreneurs that have been sold this Cinderella story, particularly by the business press. Yeah. We only celebrate you if you were literally at zero and now you're a multimillionaire. We only celebrate you. No, I'm, I'm saying this fairly, yeah, right? Yeah, we yeah. don't want to talk about those of you that have given back. No, that's, absolutely. That's dull. Yeah. We want the big numbers. We want the unicorn. Tell me about billions yeah. and then we'll talk. And yeah. that's what you're up against. We don't yeah. celebrate the good hearted. Yeah. 
But if you look at the SMEs, who are actually bigger in numbers, maybe not bigger in sales, right? Absolutely, yeah. Who are passion-led entrepreneurs, who do it for reasons beyond profit and bottom yeah. line. Yeah. And look at the impact they've made on sustainability. Yeah. Look at the impact they've made on brave change. I just wonder whether when we talk about leaders, we should really focus on those who have less red tape and more ability to make change. And they could well be a big part of the answer. You've given me a lot to think about with this conversation. Um, I always ask one question before we kind of close the podcast, which is, what gives you hope? Because this is a big job. What gives me hope is other humans. I, I adore, I mean, people say my work's complicated. I find it simplistic. It is my job to bring joy or bring a pleasurable experience to anyone in any of the industries I work in and then to do as much as I can to give back to the SMEs and charities to do the same for their customer. I know we don't like that word in, but the person benefiting the charity, benefited by the charity, the user, the, 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 the person that it's all about. And I frame everything around that. And joy comes from that. May I tell a little anecdote to finish very quickly? Absolutely. I've always, so, I've, I'm going to have one more question anyway, because no, okay. I, always, I always do that, Columbo style. So... A very famous brand, going back to theme parks, has a quite a, a strong culture. Mm. And when the 9-11 terror attacks happened, instead of having that joyous walk up to the theme park gateway, which was red carpets and smell of popcorn, a very serious thing had to happen. Security checks, bag searches, a very, very different look and feel. Yeah. And it broke up something that was a beautiful, exciting build-up into something that became very real again, very, very uh, reminder of the, the awful scenario we were all living in. Yeah. Those processes have long changed, so I'm going back a while. And we uh, heard about this piece of research where a family had come and we were talking about the experience they'd had, everything else in park, and they had a young daughter who was obsessed of a character and she dressed as a character, her bedding at home was a character. Mm. She was excited about being and seeing the character. So when she was asked the best part of her day, everyone expected her to name a princess. And she named a random gentleman's name. And her parents looked round in complete confusion and who is this person and how there were billions spent on theme park rides and activities. How, how can this be the best part of your day? And who is this? It turns out the security guard was the man because he'd identified this really unpleasant part of the business process. And what he wanted to do is make the day magical at that point. So he went and purchased a autograph book of his own money. And the autograph books in these parks are usually used for characters to sign for children. Yeah. And when he identified a young child coming through the door in dress, dress up, fancy dress, he went to the child and would say, oh my goodness, Cinderella, oh my goodness, Peter Pan, you're here, I can't believe it. Will you sign my autograph book? And he became the favorite part of that young child's day. And I boil that down to two things. One, he gave permission to her to believe in her beliefs. Yeah. And two, he made it about being human, human. And for me, I resonate with that story every day. And I try and build a world that, that gentleman did so brilliantly without really an incredible toolkit to do it. He understood a culture, he understood his job, he saw an opportunity to be a great human and he did it. And people like him will always exist, people like you will always exist and that's what makes it all worthwhile. Try not to tear up on camera on that one. Um, that's beautiful and that's, I, I would say that's almost a mic drop but I do want to ask one more question, sure. which is, we are where we are. What for you is the call to action to consumers what is the call to action for parents and what is the call to action for brands if we crystallize it down into the things that we should be doing next? These are incredible questions, Scott. And this is meant to be the last one, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. For consumers, yeah. you have power in your purse and your wallet. You must use it. Don't just sit and disconnect the change in the world you want to see and the power of your spend. You must use it purposefully. 
it may take a little longer at this point. And don't feel that you can't do fun things and don't feel it's all got to be about being as best behaved as you can, but do understand your purchase. Every single dirham makes a difference. Yeah. That's for the consumers. For the brands, you need as a leader to go to sleep on a night, put your head on the pillow and know that you have done all of the right things that day. You know that this cannot be about bottom line purely. Yeah. This is a pivotal point. It's the great rethink. It happens after every pandemic or epidemic, as long as history has been alive for us to re recall it. So do the right thing. It has to be another, I'm afraid, time of stepping up. And as we face in sustainability, we have to face into our mental health crisis and yeah. digital distress as well. Yeah. Who is the other group? Parents. Parents, you're doing a bloody amazing job. Don't beat yourself up. These are hard and difficult times. Don't let your parents tell you what they feel that should happen, everything. Guidance from grandparents is great, but they're not understanding these issues right now. Yeah. And, and almost work with your children. You know, you're not meant to have all the answers. Tell them that. It'll really help them. If I could afford another microphone, I'd get you to drop that right there because that <laughs> was a mic drop. Uh, Kate Harkas, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you on the Mental Thank Space you. Podcast. Uh, if you have enjoyed this conversation or found it as powerful as I have, please remember that you can subscribe to The Mental Space. If you're watching on YouTube, the button's just there. It helps us more than you can know. And I'm also delighted to announce that Kate will also be joining us as a judge for the Mental Awards this year. Do you remember the Mental Awards 2023 when we celebrated companies that put their people first and created cultures where we all thrive? It's back for 2024 and this year Kate will be a judge. So please do your part and look out to enter the awards this year. Kate, one last time, thank you for joining us thank on you. Mental Space.